what a privilege it is to be together in this Advent season. I really believe God's presence is right there in your home as you welcome him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your precious presence in our lives. Lord, Christmas, it seems to be about presence, but Lord, there's no presence like your presence in our lives. So precious Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, have the Holy Spirit minister to each one of us and breathe upon your word that we might gain revelation, Holy Spirit revelation for the destiny and the great plans that you have for each one of us, in, especially in this Advent season. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. This Christmas, we're talking about this Christmas and this part two, I want to dial in on prune this Christmas. Oh, oh, you might be saying, Pastor Stephen, what's this all about? Well, I'm glad you're with me. Okay, in review so far, we've learned that we get to plant this Christmas and we went on a trip to the Christmas tree farm. And if you missed it, get the app and review part one. You've, you're going to really enjoy it. You've got to see it. It's the place where Pam and I first became a couple. In part one, we learned that if we plant our faith, then there's peace on earth. We don't waste our life chasing stuff and all the things that jacked up Scrooge's life, but we plant. Ultimately, we plant in the ground of God's love. That's why God sent Jesus the angel declared good news of great joy. It's the reason for the season. Now, let's learn how we can prune this Christmas. How many times have you watched a Christmas movie where the family goes out in the forest and they find this perfectly shaped evergreen? Now, I'm not saying it can't happen, but more often than not, the wild-grown evergreen trees are beautiful in their own way, but they hardly ever have that perfectly manicured shape. Charlie Brown coveted, right? No, that's not automatic. It doesn't just happen. When I was a kid, my mom always bought a real Fraser fir tree. I remember she always wanted the real Fraser fir tree. It would smell up the house with what us kids thought was the, it was the smell of Christmas. It was fresh, not heavy, but cheerful, aromatic. It smelled like a home Christmas. Now, one thing I remember that mom would do when we put up the tree was to put the not so good side in, you know, the side with the bald patch or a few large spaces, she strategically put that side facing the corner so the tree would look its best, full. I remember that was the word she looked for. She wanted the tree to look full. And that meant the good side faced out for everyone to see, and that's what we decorated, but the bald patch in. Beautiful full trees don't always just happen. Tree experts help nature along. In fact, Genesis 2 verse 15 says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. What do you think that means? It means that Adam got to help the plant and the shrubs and the trees look their best, look full. When God gives you something to work, you get to work it. If God gave you a car, wouldn't you work it? You don't just assume it never needs the oil changed or to be gassed up every now and again. Part of working with plants and trees is the job of pruning. That means cutting stuff off purposefully, strategically, to promote intentional growth and more growth. Now, let me pause the pruning lesson here for a moment. Some of you just hearing the idea of cutting stuff off, being intentional, purposeful, and eliminating anything sounds almost traumatic to you. You've lost so many things in life and had things, circumstances, people taken away from you. So you, you kind of view the idea of pruning as adversarial. You understand why some people get so fractured that they resort to hoarding stuff. You don't want to lose those memories, the special keepsakes and all the sentimental attachment to what was so precious at one time, but it's no longer. Here's where you let God's Holy Spirit help you. Let him walk your heart into this truth. You're going to discover that pruning with wisdom will actually help you arrive at the destination that you long for so desperately this Christmas. Don't be afraid. This is going to be good for you. In fact, let me say a prayer for you right now before we go any further. God, you're not willing to break a bruised reed or extinguish a smoldering, weak flame of a candle. 
you are all powerful, but your capacity to be compassionate to our needs is beyond human understanding. Right now, I ask that you give courage and your strength to receive the word of life that you have for us today. Heal wounds, even as I speak your word of truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let me explain why pruning is applied for our benefit. Jesus told his disciples that God prunes those that are his. If you belong to God, he prunes you because he wants you, number one, growing, number two, profitable, number three, established, and number four, shaped. Think of it as the shaping of your soul, which I call character. Picture it as the excellent shape of a perfect Christmas tree. God uses pruning to promote your more perfect growth in the right areas, and that's how he shapes your soul for maximum character. 1 Peter 3, 4 refers to this type of character as incorruptible and unfading charm. Doesn't that sound evergreen? That sounds so attractive, doesn't it? Buddy Valestro, the famous baker and the star of Cake Boss, he said this, I really, listen to this, I, I so like this quote. He said, my kids are truly blessed, but the thing is, how do you make them responsible? How do you keep them grounded? When people in my factory see my kids on their hands and knees scrubbing the floors, they have respect for them. When you do the job and you clean the toilets, scrub the racks, or you clean the floor drains, you have a lot more respect for the person who does it every day. That's what my dad taught me, and I need to emphasize that to my kids. Buddy loves his kids, and he wants the best for them. He realizes that part of being blessed is learning responsibility, being grounded, planting respect so you get respect. That's a biblical principle, and believe it or not, God the Father wants you blessed. He wants you growing up like a strong, tall tree with character that is unfading, incorruptible, but that comes on the other side of, you guessed it, pruning. Let me give you some scripture to prove my point here. Jesus said this in John 15, verses one and two. He said, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Any branch in me that does not bear fruit that stops bearing, he cuts away, trims off, takes away, and he cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit to make it bear more and richer and more excellent fruit. Oh, I know you heard those words, more, richer, excellent. This is Jesus talking. It's God's will for you, but it comes as the benefit of pruning. Why would we run from the expert pruner? God is an expert pruner. If he's cutting away something, it's, it's something that interferes with his agenda for your more, your richer, your excellent. Do you know how many believers make a religion out of running from God's pruning? Jesus said, God repeatedly prunes us. Why? To work the biblical principle that Buddy the Baker understands. You need to bow low to go up higher, even if it means cleaning a toilet. Say the truth out loud. I need to bow down low, say it. I need to bow down low to permit God to take me higher. You want proof of that truth? Matthew 23, verse 12. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, Whoever humbles himself shall be raised to honor. Jesus was talking. I could mention 1 Peter 5, 6. I could mention Luke 14, 11, And all of it points to the same principle, bowing down low to go up higher. We saw how Jesus compared us to branches needing pruned. Look at Psalm 1, verse 3. And he shall be like a tree firmly planted and tended by the streams of water, ready to bring forth fruit in its season. You know that word tended, it means pruned. That's you. You're meant to be like a tree planted by the waters and be pruned. Okay, let me give you one more scripture to point out your amazing destiny. Psalm 92, verse 12. The righteous will shoot up like a palm tree. They will grow tall like a cedar in Lebanon. Again, let me say it. This is you shooting up, growing tall in character, more, increased, excellent, the only way you deny this movement upward is if you bought into the lie that pruning is not for you. That means only you can stop you. Other people can't stop God from pruning you. Oh, I've got to say that again because some of you are texting your Christmas list to Santa. Listen close. Only you can stop 
you. Other people cannot stop God from pruning you. Pruning is essential to growth that God has ordained for you. If promotion is part of God's destiny for you, and it is, oh yes it is, then pruning is part of God's plan for your life. Say it, pruning is for me. Promotion is for me. Therefore, pruning is for me. Ah, you got it, you got it. Ted Turner, you probably have heard that name. He's the famous broadcasting entrepreneur and he's the creator of CNN. He said this, if only I had a little humility, I would be perfect. Oh, Teddy, Teddy, Teddy. What a burden being so Teddy. Forgive me if Ted's sentiment reminds me a little bit of another infamous businessman. In Charles Dickens' story, A Christmas Carol, Scrooge's former business partner, Jacob Marley, he shows up as a ghost to haunt Scrooge and he says this, I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Is its pattern strange to you? <laughs> That's my best imitation of a ghost. <clears throat> the message I believe Dickens is getting across to us is the necessity of intentionally pruning our selfishness with faith-inspired generosity. Prune our pride with a biblical humility. Here's the absolute truth. Pruning is for all of us. Proverbs 18, 12 says, haughtiness comes before disaster, but humility before honor. When we bow down low, we grow up like a cedar of Lebanon. Part of submitting to God is submitting to his expert pruning. Talking about Ebenezer Scrooge, at the end of A Christmas Carol, the story hits the happy mark when Scrooge repents of all of his selfishness, meanness, and indifference to become a benevolent father figure to Tiny Tim and all those around him. The author closes with this reflection. He was better than his word. Scrooge kept Christmas well. There was nothing wrong with Scrooge being rich, folks. That wasn't the problem. In fact, because Scrooge was rich, he was able to help the Cratchit family after he was reborn, so to speak. His big problem was that he had just lived a life too long without pruning. He'd grown in the one secular area of life, but was deprived of sunlight in the critical areas of life. Getting pruned allows light and honor to overtake the dark places of our life. Like I said, there's nothing wrong with being rich or successful, but pride is a Proverbs 18, 12 prelude to disaster. That's what we heard. Adam Sandler, famous comedian and movie star and producer, he said this, my name is Adam Sandler. I'm not particularly talented. I'm not particularly good looking. And yet I'm a multimillionaire. <laughs> Funny quote, but this is what I hear Adam saying. He said, I learned that bowing low, staying out of pride, lifts Sandler up for a successful ride. Something like that. Now, of course, having money and fame is such a tiny fractional part of success. Just ask Scrooge about that. The main principle here is one of pruning. We all need to and get to eliminate pride, selfishness, arrogance, anger, resentment, dishonor, bad attitudes, you know, all the stuff that interferes with love, peace, joy, a merry heart, and, and a good old rump a pum pum right? We need it. This is why we need to prune this Christmas. There's the pruning that God does, but there's the stuff that we pull out the pruning shears and intentionally cut away ourselves in obedience to God. Pruning is a decision whether we allow God to do it or we respond to his conviction and we do it. Pam and me laughing so hard not too long ago, we had some guys doing some work in our neighborhood and on our property. They had these motorized hedgers and trimmers and some chainsaws and they were busy with the work of pruning. Pam did not like it at all. She said, I just don't like all that cutting and that pruning away and the sound of those loud motors aggressively slicing at our shrubs. <laughs> Pam really, get this, Pam really likes growth, but pruning sometimes to her seems counterintuitive. That's why we pulled out good old 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith and not by sight or our feelings. Successful pruning is not a feeling thing. It's an investment for the outcome thing. 
So let's talk about feelings. Are you emotionally attached to what needs to be pruned? Let me get serious here. I understand if you are. My mom passed away now less than two years ago. Christmas will never be the same again. That doesn't mean it can't be beautiful, joyful, and inspiring. But I have to be willing to prune my attachment to the past. It doesn't mean that I don't dearly love my mom and cherish all the memories with her, especially those at Christmas time. She was a hero in my life. But understand this, God's will is for me to keep moving forward. God has amazing days to come, but they're in the future, they're not in the past. There are amazing people in my future, so I have to make room. It's not disrespect for your loved ones who are gone. It's honoring because eternity is where we're all going and it expresses faith that you're moving forward, moving forward. So some of you need to be willing to prune yourself away from the past. Don't let the past, as wonderful as it's been, become the mistletoe curse to this Christmas. That's right. Some of us have allowed the mistletoe curse to overcome our present day, our tomorrow, the future, this Christmas, and our future. Mistletoe is a popular decoration at Christmas with white berries and green leaves. It's usually hung over the doorway. The tradition is if a couple is caught standing underneath the hanging plant, they're supposed to embrace and kiss. Ah, isn't that so romantic? The truth is, Mistletoe is actually a parasite. Did you know that? Its scientific name means tree thief. Its leaves and its extract are extremely poisonous. Oh, how lovely is that? Mistletoe attaches itself to a healthy tree by sticking its wedge-shaped roots into the limbs and sucking all the moisture and the nutrients out of it slowly over time. Each passing year, the tree gets weaker and weaker, producing fewer and fewer leaves, while the mistletoe gets stronger and stronger, producing more leaves until the host tree dies. Then the mistletoe also dies. Now, do you know what could have been done at the very start? I mean, sooner than later? Prune the mistletoe off your life tree. It doesn't matter how pretty you think it is and it's white berries and it's leaves. It's sucking the life out of you. That old tradition that doesn't serve your family dynamic any longer. Let it go. Prune it. It doesn't mean that when your kids were little and they all wore elf pajamas that it wasn't cute, but your daughter's married now and her husband's 240 pounds and he, he resents wearing the family elf pajamas. He just, he doesn't look good in candy apple red and mint green. Let it go. Prune it away. Move on. Make a new tradition. See what good things God has in store for you and your family if you'll only be free from mistletoe theology. So let's jump over to the Lendrick Christmas Tree Farm and see if they had to prune to make this a beautiful Christmas. I'm here with Ed Nash. Ed, thanks again for having us on the tree farm. You know, I'm looking around all these beautiful, beautiful trees, and you gotta tell me, do they just grow this way? Well, you wish they would. No, there's a lot of pruning involved. So if you don't do the pruning, you're gonna get a real bushy tree. And so we just prune a little bit um, each year, allows everything to fill in throughout the other years, and you get a beautiful Christmas tree. Now you're carrying a big blade. It looks very savage. And I gotta ask you, does pruning hurt the tree? I mean, like it just, it looks painful. <laughs> no, it actually makes the tree a little bit healthier. Um, well, when we prune it off, it'll just shape it up. It'll bring some more nutrients into the other branches and just cause it to grow better. You told me I had some trees at home, um, evergreen trees, and, and they were having some bald spots. And I was like, I wasn't sure what to do. And you were like, hey, just prune them, man. When you prune them, you will promote growth. And I, I was just telling you earlier, they're really doing well. The pruning, they really respond to. Yeah, they do enjoy it. It's a good thing for them, keeps them healthy. Like I said before, it makes them grow well. Um, it's just a much better tree. So you have so many beautiful trees. Can you maybe show us how to do this? How you do this on a, maybe you got an ugly tree you can kind of work on? Well, sure. 
We can do that. We're going right next to us. Let's give it a whirl. Ed, that was amazing. I mean, it was kind of violent. <laughs> but at the same time, too, it's amazing that that's part of what makes ugly now beautiful and you're steering toward a desired outcome. And what do we call this again? Pruning. Pruning, folks. That's a technical term. <laughs> Pruning. That's how you make ugly Christmas trees into beautiful Christmas trees. Are you kidding me? If you want a great Christmas tree, you must prune it for all to see. Honestly, that should have been a line in The Grinch You Stole Christmas. Wasn't that a great trip to the Lenrick tree farm? Pruning is not only necessary, it's good. It's wholesome. Seeing how beautiful those trees grow when the expert prunes them makes me think of that scripture again, John 15, verse 2, Jesus talking, and he says, He cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit to make it bear more and richer and more excellent fruit. Look, when you belong to God, he places a great priceless value on you. That means he takes care of you, and part of him taking good care of you is that he pruned you. Still, God can't do anything in your life without your faith permission. That's right. He can't even save you without your permission. Why, you ask? Because at the beginning of humanity, God made us all in his likeness, and that required dominion and authority here on earth. You don't have to obey God, but you get to. We don't have to be pruned. We get to. You don't have to obey God and let go of the past for the future. You get to. That's right. You get to. God's word says in Romans 12, verse 2, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, proving what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That word conform means to take the shape of. If you don't allow God to prune, you take an ugly, ugly shape, inspired by a dark, lost world. Growth is only good when it's sanctioned by the giver of all life. He's the growth expert. God's the growth expert. God can renew the troubled places of your mind if, if you give him permission to prune away what is not profitable to your future. His amazing will for your future. Let's pray together and trust ourselves to God's precision. Pray this after me. God, we want to live free. Free from the past. Free from what holds us back. We put all our trust in you. You gave your son Jesus to pay the price for all our sins. By his wounds, death is cut away from our heart and soul. You raised up Jesus from the grave. He's the reason for the season. Jesus is the gift. Glory to God in the highest. We say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.